All right, friends, welcome back. It's great to have you. I know we'll have another couple coming in just uh, just a moment. We'll begin, though, uh, with uh, prayer before we start Native Americans and the Constitution and this wonderful document from uh, George Washington's third annual address from 1791. So, Caleb, would you be willing to open our class with a prayer? Thank you so much. Our dear, kind and gracious Father in heaven, we thank thee for this beautiful day and for the chance we have to be here at this wonderful God-inspired school. And we thank thee for this class and for the things that we are learning. We ask at this time that thy spirit may be with us to help us to understand and to be able to comprehend and reason through these background and source and be able to really learn about the Constitution and how it protects everyone's rights and help us to be able to understand so that we may apply and help others to learn what their rights truly are and be able to come closer to God through upholding those rights. We thank thee for Mr. Gentile and for the efforts that he puts into this class and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Caleb. All right, well, friends, you know, speaking of uh, the Constitution, I, th I think this is, this is really fascinating. Uh, topic uh, to consider for those who you know are, are very interested in the workings of the Constitution and, and the history of, of that great document. You know, if we take a look here, what we'll see is that the status of Native Americans under the Constitution in the early Republic was one that was um, in flux. Uh, that especially as as we take a look um, at uh, John Marshall and some landmark cases uh, in the early 1830s, uh, we'll see that there were some decisions made uh, that. Uh, the United States president, especially Andrew Jackson, uh, would essentially say, you can go jump in a lake because I don't really care. Um, and would do his own thing anyway. Um, and, and essentially said, well, you know, John Marshall's spoken, but let's see him enforce it. And, and so this is, this is a real, this is a real issue uh, that, we'll, that we'll see here. Anyway, uh, Indians within the territorial boundaries of the United States were treated as peculiar cases. Uh, they were denied citizenship exempted from taxation and not counted towards the representation or direct taxation of the states in which they lived. So this really is a peculiar group um, living here. The Constitution granted federal officials the power to regulate commerce with Indian tribes and the power to make treaties or war with native peoples in order to license in regulate and regulate trade with them or acquire their lands. In the early republic, the government's purpose in dealing with native tribes was twofold. To remove them so American westward expansion could proceed and to protect them in unceded territories. Now we'll see, they'll have great issues with both of those things, uh, which will lead to all the other topics in, in, our, in our unit, uh, the second half of the unit, uh, to, to, be, to be true. Uh, and so with that said, and we've already talked about this idea of, well, j just go far enough west and, and we'll leave you alone. You won't have any issues. Well, as the country continues to expand, far enough west doesn't quite cut it. Um, and then what we'll see is for those who are on the east of the Mississippi uh, living in territory that hadn't been ceded, um, we'll see states trying to kick Indians off their land and the federal government saying, no, 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 no. The states don't have the power to do that because the federal or the national, maybe that's an easier term to think of, the national government needs to be the one to make these decisions. And so these are their tribal lands in Georgia, for example, which would be a flashpoint um, on this issue. And, and uh, this is where we'll see Andrew Jackson saying, well, I, I don't really care. Um, I'm happy to see the state of Georgia kick them out and, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. And so they wait. <laughs> What's going on here? So lots of a uh, of mess. You know, as we take a look at, of course, this famous picture, uh, we see Washington here uh, standing up uh, in uh, this great constitutional uh, convention to to uh, debate these issues, and and they, you know, were sort of scratching their heads. What is the best thing to do uh, with these Indian tribes? Well, we'll see that Washington himself had some very clear principles. Um, in dealing with the natives, and, and I think you'll really enjoy this document. It's one of my very favorites because I feel that it's just so inspired in taking a look at uh, a very even-handed way of acknowledging their rights, but also trying to help them in ways that he knew would, would, would help them. And so uh, that's, that'll be wonderful. But, but what we'll see, though, is that Andrew Jackson really is a president who would muddy the waters in, in a number of different ways. 
Uh, some people will, will love him because uh, of uh, his stance on the uh, the national bank, but on the other hand, we'll see that he'll do a lot of, 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 of damage when it came to what were known as domestic dependent nations. And you're going to say, what? What are those? Well, um, they had a hard time defining exactly what that meant um, in the 1800s uh, as well. So by the time Andrew Jackson became president in 1829, he denied that tribes could be independent nations within sovereign states and thought it absurd that the federal government made treaties with tribes as though they were sovereign nations. In Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, 1831, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the opinion of Chief Justice John Marshall that native tribes were neither states in the Union nor foreign nations and could, therefore, not maintain actions in federal courts. Instead, Marshall claimed that tribes were in a special class, and here's the quote, domestic dependent nations that were under the sovereignty and dominion of the U.S. government, not the states, which gave them, the native tribes, the unquestionable right to their lands until they voluntarily ceded them to the federal government. Now, the problem was you had all these tribes who did not want to voluntarily cede their land, and the states couldn't handle it because they wanted the land and decided to take matters into their own hands, saying, well, national government, you know, this isn't your issue. We're going to take these lands because we want them. And the national government saying, no, 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 we're trying to protect these tribes in this very strange situation, and we need to be the ones dealing with them. And anyway, caused all sorts of headaches, to say the least. Um, anyway, in Worcester uh, versus Georgia, 1832, the Supreme Court held that the Cherokee Nation was a distinct political community that had territorial boundaries in which the laws of Georgia could have no effect. States were to defer to the federal government in all issues related to the welfare and governments of native tribes. Um, so let's just step back for a moment. Um, tell me, do you feel, because you have to understand where this is coming from, these things that John Marshall advocated for that the Supreme Court would then uphold were not part of the original Constitution in, in this level of specificity. What we'll see is that these came through interpretation of the Constitution through this idea of judicial review that Chief Justice John Marshall would make very famous or infamous, depending on who you ask. Um, and so what we'll see is this is the Supreme Court stepping in and saying, we interpret the Constitution to mean this regarding native rights. And others are saying, well, it doesn't say that in the Constitution. We're states. They're living in our states. We should be the ones to make these decisions. And you have the national government butting heads with state governments. And this is the same type of an issue that would lead to the Civil War. Uh, just now here, this is the Indian question instead of the slave question. So uh, my question to you is, what think ye? <laughs> what would your reason uh, regarding this idea of judicial review, uh, the Supreme Court interpreting the Constitution in a way that would sort of add to, in these ways, the original document from the founders? Is this helpful in protecting rights, or is this not helpful because it's trampling on states' rights? Please. Why were the Indians not? Why were the Indians not considered citizens of the United States? Great question. Because they didn't want to be. That, that, that's probably the, the, the best answer. Now there are other answers as well. Um, but one of them is that they said we are our own nation. They they thought of themselves like France or Spain or another country. They felt that they were foreign nations. Um, and they felt, I mean, obviously there's a whole lot of baggage here, but they're essentially saying, you invaded us. Uh, now you're the dominant power, but we still live here. Therefore, even though we're living on your land and don't quite have our own you know, boundaries that are you know, far away and you know, easily tucked into their own corners, um, it's like treating with France when you treat with us. Now, the U.S. wasn't willing, as you see, John Marshall wasn't willing to go that far um, as saying that, well, you know, you're like France. But what they were willing to say as well, but, but you're certainly not U.S., right? You're certainly your own thing. And so we have to give you a certain amount of autonomy, but yet um, we can't also treat you like someone who's really an equal because you don't have the clout of an equal because you're living among us and we're letting you do that. Does that make sense? Even though we really could attack you at any moment and kick you up. 
But you were here before. Please. I, excuse me, I have just never thought that this was a solvable problem mm -hmm. without the Book of Mormon. Yes, yes. Oh, I, I love that. And, and, and isn't this interesting? Because God gave them the Book of Mormon the year before these two cases. Well, the first one's 1831, the second one's 1832. But 1830, we have the publication of this great book that could have been, if used, the answer to these issues. But yet, so many tried it in other ways that led to just so much unnecessary heartache and really no solution that's worked. And even today, who is, welcome, JT. Who's going to say that this has worked? I mean, this, this, it's a debacle. Of, of drastic proportions, even to this day, this 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 Indian question, you know, yes. And, and I think both sides have suffered greatly. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I, I completely agree. Completely agree. Please. Um, why, why were the Indians so opposed to joining the U.S. or like being integrated into? Uh, sure. In society. In some ways, it would just be like saying, "Well, why don't the Canadians just all become U.S. citizens? Aren't we better?" I mean, right? I mean, we, we, you could say we're more power. We have more money. We have a better military. We have more freedom. I mean, you could you could make a list. But if they want to be their own entity, if they really don't consider themselves as having the same identity as us, they want to have a separate nation. Does that make it sort of just a personal choice? Of I I I am Mohawk. I'm not American in the way that you're American. I don't want to be part of the United States. You'd think they would see the improved lifestyle and mm -hmm. the, the sure. prosperity. And right, right. would be like, hey, we want to be part right. of that, but I, I can't understand like why they would want to just like go be their own thing and just mm -hmm. live in really poor communities and just have a horrible life. Right. I mean, obviously, I'm sure they didn't want to have a horrible life, but 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 they had a hope that it would be better um, if they could remain with their own people in the, in what they would hope would be considered a sovereign nation. But yet, as we see that, um, it just won't be feasible for so many reasons. So it's a, it's a great question, and this, these are hard questions. I mean, if, if there was an easy answer, I'm sure somebody would have figured it out, <laughs> right? Um, and and I love I love you know really if we were to go back to the Book of Mormon, we would have so many more happy things to say about, about this topic. Now, the interesting thing is, I, I think we do have some happy things to talk about, which is why I really want to focus on Washington today, this great president of ours, the father of our, of our country, um, in at least a, a, a temporal sense, right? Of course, I, I think, obviously, Heavenly Father and, and uh, his son, Jesus Christ, are, are more father figures uh, in, in a spiritual way. But I want to go here for a moment here. I, I think this is really fascinating to go to to, to Washington, because think about Washington's war. We talked about that, you know, fallen timbers and all that. We just talked about then, you know, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Um, and here we are in 1795 at the end of the war, um, and you have Washington um, giving us some really interesting insights that I want to set as some context for this background that I then want to reason and relate, because I think it's a, a noble document. Um, so following the Treaty of, of Granville uh, that ended Washington's war, and saw 12 defeated tribes cede two-thirds of present-day Ohio and part of Indiana for one-eighth of a cent per acre, and the short-lived promise of a lasting boundary between Indian country and the United States, President George Washington lamented what he called the important truth that, quote, the provisions heretofore made with a view to the protection of the Indians from the violences of the lawless part of our frontier inhabitants are insufficient, and you recognize that. He said, right now, we don't have a solution that's doing anybody justice, right? This isn't right for the United States, and it really isn't right for the natives either. Um, and so what do we do? And so that's why he'll propose some things. Um, it's interesting here, just, just a picture of, of the Treaty of Grenville, you know, that 1795 uh, treaty. You can just sort of imagine this uh, going on as, as we think about this. A year later then, okay, after the treaty, we'll see that the president expressed his wish that the federal government protect the rights secured to the Indians by treaty to draw them nearer to the civilized state and inspire them with the correct conceptions of the power as well as the justice of the government. 
close quote. As the earlier public matured with each succeeding president, Washington's desire for Indian assimilation into American civilization went largely unfulfilled, and another policy, removal, started to become the chief focus of U.S.-Indian relations. So this is an interesting thing to consider. Washington's hope is that, well, why don't we help them to enjoy, this is sort of your saying, the benefits of a Christian republic. Uh, but yet we'll see that when Indians, uh, and once again, some certainly uh, enjoyed that type of assimilation, but many didn't. Uh, when they sort of gave this message of, you know, we really sort of want to do our own thing, uh, then we'll see that essentially it was, well, uh, I guess if choice won't work, we'll go to plan B, which is force. Um, and that's where things just become very sad. And, and uh, these are interesting quotes here. Oh, please go ahead. Today, <clears throat> to this very day, the Indians in this state are very upset that their children, when their children have to be placed in foster care, yes. they're not placed in Indian homes. To this day, right. they're fighting that. Yes. And, and, and the idea of still of whose land is it? Right. Oh, exactly, exactly. And that's the, these questions haven't gone away. Uh, they're, they're still here, and I may as well see. Um, here's 1796 now, and we're fighting the same wars of words and opinions uh, here in 2016. So thank you so much for that. It's a wonderful, wonderful insight. Uh, you know, as President Thomas Jefferson expressed to William Henry Harrison in 1803, Native peoples could, quote, either incorporate with us as citizens of the United States, or remove beyond the Mississippi. So that's sort of this ultimatum that we have with Jefferson. If they resisted, Jefferson asserted, quote, we have only to shut our hand to crush them. And so this is where we'll see the U.S. is in the position of power. The Indians are, are, are you know, sort of given a little bit of agency to act. When they don't choose to act, the U.S. is saying, well, if you don't act, then, then we will force you because we have the power to do it. And we'll see all sorts of resentment and, and just it'll just be a mess. Uh, but anyway, to quote historian Anthony F.C. Wallace, the uh, America Jefferson envisioned, quote, left no place for Indians as Indians. You can be Indians, but you need to then become Americans. Um, and really, we're asking you to leave behind a lot of your, quote, unquote, Indianness. Of course, that didn't seem acceptable. Anyway, people have been fighting about it ever since. But we'll, we'll cover more of that sort of identity, those issues, um, in some later topics. But today, I really want to take a look for a moment at, at General Washington, because I love what a great example General Washington was, now for President Washington, um, to each of us as we kind of think through these, these tricky issues. And I want you to look at how much he tried to do uh, to remedy the situation. He really tried. Um, and, and, I, and I think really uh, tried to be so full of integrity in his dealings with Native peoples, which is, is just a wonderful example uh, to us. So what I'd ask you to do is take a look at this great document. So we'll take a look here. This is the third annual uh, address. This is October of, of 1791. Uh, we'll see that Washington's war started in 1790, would end in 1795. Uh, and as you take a look, this is his third annual address. Think of this as uh, something akin to our State of the Union address, that kind of a thing. Um, as you take a look at it, here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, this time, um, I'd ask you to go ahead and reason principles of truth from this document as Washington thought about how to treat Native peoples. Um, as you look at these principles of truth, I'll ask you to take just a section of it so we can sort of divide and conquer to have this discussion, because I think this will be really interesting for us. Um, all right. What I'll ask you to do is I'll, I'll give you a different paragraph. So you could be so the first paragraph, Brenna, and then JT, you could be the second. Are we all, are we all there? So if I point to the second, you could be okay. Okay, you could be the second. All right, and then if you could be the third, Samuel, and then the fourth, Gordon, the fifth for Rachel, the sixth for Mrs. Andalyn. So is it for the overtures or sincerely? Sorry. Uh, it is sincerely. It will be the, the sixth. And then for Camilla, we, well, <laughs> we won't give you. How would you do the three there? In order, that they, and that mode. That mode, okay? Those three. Uh, and then what about Caleb, that commerce? With them, we, we, we happen to get that one we talked about. Yeah. But, okay, great. Uh, and then Logan, would you do that? The executive of the United States, uh, and then also Leah, would you do the last two for us? 
and that efficacious provision and as well a system corresponding. Okay. Uh, would you just take a look at yours? As you look at it, go ahead and read it. That will be the, re the research, and hopefully you've already read it before, but just one more time. And then would you just reason if there's anything in yours, and it may be too short to have anything of, of uh, great substance in there, but, but there also could be a nugget uh, that you might want to then reason and share with the class. I would simply ask you to reason a truth that you see Washington acting in accordance with from yours, okay? When you see one, would you just go ahead and raise your hand and let us know? So you'll be reasoning true principles from Washington's third annual address. And essentially, you'll see these will be true principles in dealing uh, with anybody, but in this case, uh, Indian tribes. Because you'll see he works very, very hard to act according to these principles that he felt were right. <clears throat> Rachel, we've got a microphone, I'm sure. Just thank you, Camilla. Okay, so I had the fifth paragraph, and I just like the first clause. Overtures of peace are still continued to the diluted tribes, um, just that they are still trying to reach out to them in like peaceful actions. Okay. And then I liked where it said that certain of them have renounced opposition and like become a part of the union. Okay, I love that. Let's relate that true principle to a home, to a family. When do we ever continue offering principles of peace even to deluded uh, siblings, <laughs> so to speak? Please go ahead, Rachel. Should I give like a personal example? Please, if you, um, yes. When they, well, when Samuel. Uh, when Samuel walked, when Sam sleeps in, we can oh. continue to go invite him to come to scripture study. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Principle of peace. Thank well, you. Usually they just let me keep sleeping. Usually they don't. They, they just let me sleep. Okay. They don't wake me up. Right, right. No, what I do is don't come back. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> I missed it. Wait. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anyone else? Have you ever seen how offering principles of peace, even if they're not accepted at first, how that can make a positive difference in a home? Please, Caleb. So it's kind of a silly little example because it was I was eleven-ish. Sure. Was little. Um, so me and my brother. It's just me and my brother. Yeah. He's five years younger than me, um, and we can kind of beat each other's throats sometimes because okay. we're brothers. Right. And we're best friends. Yes. And we argue, but so this one time when we were kind of, I don't even know what it was about, but we were both mad, we both went to our rooms, and, you know, picture this 11-year-old and 6-year-old, and um, basically it was like, okay, we can either be mad at each other for a good part of the day, and then be best friends in the evening, or we can just make up and be friends now, and so I drew this little sign that had, like, all these little like things like welcome Jacob and you know, you know all people are welcome here and I taped it to my door and um, within a half an hour there was a similar drawing on his door oh. and we were best friends again um, so just you know, you know we could have carried that out we could have held a grudge or whatever and been fine but we could have ruined the whole day and rather than that we had a little Side on our door that we every time we're mad at each other now we look at it and we're like oh, okay right so it's it's helped us then and it helped us kind of growing up too yes so, I don't know. well I love that offering it's peace so <laughs> the yeah. sign of welcome thank you for that um, let, let's talk for a moment and we don't have to necessarily talk about specific people in these situations but I'm curious in your homes what are the issues over which 
wars are fought? Food. Food? Oh, okay, tell, tell me about that. <laughs> um, well, in, in generalities, you know, you don't need to throw anybody under the bus, but, uh, but just what, what do you mean by food? Uh, the yummiest food is the most popular, uh, and everyone wants to eat it. Okay. And, uh, is it sort of a first come, first served uh, idea? That's what happens. Okay. And that's what happens. People then say, like, like oh, ah. well, and how, <laughs> my mom will say, oh, save some for that. <laughs> right, right, right. No. <laughs> no way. Like, I'd like to have 23 pieces of chocolate. <laughs> Rachel's like, I just would want one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that happens. And um, my mom's always trying to make a say that for people. Okay. Or different things like that. But usually, if she doesn't say that, uh, it all goes. Okay. And people are mad, like, where's the good food? Or right. Or was in the fridge? Or where's the chocolates? So, right. Yeah, so. Okay. Thank you for that. Please. Gordon. Well, another thing that happens in our house, sometimes Samuel and Rachel will play this big ping pong tournament. Uh -huh. We'll play like six games, uh -huh. and I'll really want to play. <laughs> and so me and Rachel, we start fighting at one end of the table <laughs> while Sam's just well, they all want to play with me. Uh -huh. Yeah. So oh. oh. <laughs> There's another side to this story. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Usually so ping pong. Make him go search for ping pong balls if he wants. <laughs> yeah, they're like, if you'll find a ping pong ball. You can ball find ball 17. Ball. I'll play with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Great. Rachel, do you, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, okay. Um, Leah, what about in your home? What are some of the, the issues that could cause contention? If overtures of peace are continually offered to the deluded. Who's right? Oh, okay. <laughs> this could be about kind of anything? Um, yeah. Ah, I see. Okay. Thank you for that. Brenda, what about in your home? Uh, I don't know. Usually it's like small things like who gets the computer, uh, you know, whose turn, it, whose turn it is to use such and such. Okay. Like who gets shotgun. Uh, so kind oh. of sharing and turns okay, with desirable things. Great, thank you for that. Mrs. Updike, please. Bye. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> go gadget arm. Yeah. <laughs> My oldest son is autistic. Okay. Very high functioning, very bright. But he was given the gift of making peace. Mm. Now, to know him, we, we all have been so frustrated with him at times because his mental processes don't go all the way from cause to effect. He, his brain is just not wired that way, so we're often frustrated. And I really feel, you now for instance, he'll get a bag of frozen strawberries out of the freezer and bang them so hard in the sink to break right. them apart that he breaks the sink. <laughs> right. <laughs> because at no malintent, he right. just doesn't follow that process. Right, right. And I think Heavenly Father compensated for that mm. by giving him the gift of making peace. Whenever anything was passed out, he'd always wait till last. Mm. He'd always take whatever was left. And if somebody didn't have something, he'd give them his. Mm. Just a peacemaker. And that, in, in the dynamic mm. of our family, just helped everybody love him, even though there were always problems. Not that he intended, sure. but it always happened just because of his thinking process. Yes. So it's, it's been an interesting um, dynamic in our family. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and I love how, friends, once again, just to sort of take a step back from what we're doing, we're talking about an annual address from a president of the United States, and look at how we've been able to relate it to our homes. That is one of the great blessings of the 4 RA method. This is coming back. We're talking, we're talking about native tribes and treaties and you know the Constitution, but yet here we are talking about being peacemakers in our homes because General Washington talked about making peace, even with those who aren't yet ready to accept it, perhaps. Um, I love that. I think that is a beautiful thing that you are all doing. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you for that and remind you that this is a great method that we really could use in other areas of our lives, too. Please, Leah. 
Um, this is actually another part, or yeah. my part, and yes. it goes along with this. So um, it says, and this is the second to last paragraph, um, by violating their rights, um, shall infringe the treaties and endanger the peace of the Union. So um, George Washington really wanted peace with everybody, and um, he wanted what was best for the nation, and um, so I thought that kind of added on. Yes, well, thank you for that. It's the idea of what's best for everyone. That's an interesting way to think about it. Thank you so much. Uh, let's think for a moment um, about someone you know who's really good at thinking about what's best for everyone. This isn't, of course, Heavenly Father would apply and Christ, but someone you know personally who, who, who really does a good job of that. Not that they're perfect, um, but that perhaps among others that you know, uh, they're a little bit more exemplary. Um, who do you know and what do they do? Yeah. Well, one that Sam was kind of talking about is my mom. Yeah. She's always trying to make sure that no one gets left out. Oh. And, yeah. I love yeah, that. I really don't think they, like, deserve the chocolate. Ah! <laughs> They're not. What? what they don't want yes. to Right. Thank you. <laughs> they never knew it was there. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Well, there may be there may be 28 pieces of chocolate, but if I eat them all, no one will miss them. <laughs> they won't even know that they, that they had a chance to eat them. <laughs> no, I think I think that's very natural, right? <laughs> Certainly, but but I do love I do love um, what uh, you said about your mother. How she really wants to make sure that everyone's included. Such a great, ex just great uh, example of her mother heart. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, anyone else? Camilla. Um, I think. Oh, just uh, thank you. Well, my mom, um, she uh, always tries to include everybody in the family and all the family gatherings and um, try to make sure everybody feels welcome. And so my sister-in-law, mm -hmm. um, even though sometimes it might be a little bit inconvenient to go and babysit her kids, um, my mom will go out and babysit them so that um, any time that uh, my sister-in-law wants to come visit us, she'll feel welcome and loved. Mm -hmm. so. That is wonderful. I'm happy you can hear that. I think that's wonderful praise for someone who deserves it. <laughs> so, um, anyone else, someone you know who's just a wonderful example of looking out for the best for everyone? Gordon? I do have an example of when my mom. Oh, sure. Help us. Sure. So last night, the family meeting, um, Sam and Rachel, as usual, they went down for their ping pong game. <laughs> <laughs> and so. We were like, we're going to have our own family meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> oh. oh, no. So, <laughs> me, we have two chess sets. And oh. so, um, me and my mom. And my dad and my little sister, we went upstairs and we set up the two chess sets and we played drop chess. Oh. And my mom and dad, they easily could have not done that with us because it's just a game for family night, but they did it with us. So. Oh, I love that. Make sure you had something to do as well. That was enjoyable. Thank you for that. Well, friends, I appreciate, appreciate your great relating there. What else did you see uh, in terms of true principles that... President Washington talked about. Yes, Caleb. Um, so mine was, and I forgive me, I don't know what number it is. Oh, no, that's all right. Um, it starts with that commerce. Um, sure. It talks about how uh, rational experiments should be made. So not just like saying, oh, here, this is good for you because it's good for us, but thinking about it. Um, for imparting to them the blessings of civilization as may from time to time suit their condition. Mm -hmm. So I like this because it's not saying like, okay, well, this is good for me, so it's good for you. Right. It sh should be, okay, well, maybe this will help you, and here, it's still your choice. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it's still kind of giving them the choice of how American they want to be. Right. But at the same time, it's open that if they want to be part of what we have, then they're more than welcome to yeah. do Oh, I love that. The blessings of civilization. Um, how do we impart those blessings to others today? Essentially, the blessings of American civilization here. Yes. Well, I was just kind of 
say this. Some of these paragraphs reminded me of a bishop. Yeah. Just like the paragraph that I had. He, he just said, it's sincerely to be desired that all need of coercion in the future may cease and that an intimate intercourse may succeed, calculated mm -hmm. to advance the happiness of these people and mm -hmm. to attach them firmly to the ward. For <laughs> sure. And, and, these people. And, and all of these things, to cure an equitable deportment toward them. And, and so all it was done with persuasion, gentleness. Right. You know, just like we're taught to do. Yes. Anyway, I, I thought that really reminds me of the way the bishops were. Oh, I love that. Oh. <laughs> President Washington would have made a wonderful bishop. <laughs> so, and if they have uh, you know wards in the, the spirit world, I'm sure he's one now, right? So to speak. Okay. That's not, I'm not don't, don't quote me on that as doctrinal. Just, that's my own opinion. But I think he would do a wonderful job. So, all right. Uh, anyone else? Um, please. J oh, JT and then Camilla. Um, mine, just like last sentence, stands to accomplish it in the most humane principles. Hmm. That's the uh, primary wish. Yes. So just like making this humane, I guess, not yeah. acting in violence. Yes. Okay. And this is interesting, too, because this idea, sometimes we have to do, and we'll come to yours, Camilla, in just a moment. Uh, sometimes we really have to do difficult things, that, that it's for the best in others' lives that we make a hard decision, that we don't necessarily give them what they want but that we give them what they need. Um, that our advice perhaps isn't uh, pleasant to hear, but yet it's for the best. How, when we have to communicate something difficult, do you think we could do it in a more humane way, so to speak? Have you ever found a good way to communicate something hard to someone else? And this could be really hard. Please, JT. Maybe trying to see it from their point of view. Okay. Trying to understand um, what they're going through. Yes. You explain okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. I love that. Um, please, Caleb. I think a lot of times. I think a lot of times we, similar to what JT is saying, we kind of just go out and just say things. Right. Or we don't. We don't really think about what. The reaction would be from whatever it is we're actually doing. I think that's a lot of times what happens in families where we argue about stupid stuff <laughs> because we don't think about, you know, we think about just ourselves. We don't <laughs> think about how that's going to affect someone else's day or whatever. But just like recognizing that there's more than one play. It's more than just you and whatever you're saying. There's other things in play. And recognizing how that might make someone else feel or how that affects what they're going mm. through rather than just what you're going through. Yes, I love that. You know, there is a good, better, and best in both the what and the how of what we say. That's important to remember because sometimes we'll be so excited that we know what's best for somebody that we blurt it out in a way that maybe is only good and not better or best. Ideally, we will say the best things in the best ways. That can be tricky, you know. Uh, it can really be tricky. <laughs> so, but that's what we're striving for. So let me ask you for a moment. Who's someone you know, as we, as we relate to this great principle that we have from, from General Washington, who's someone you know who's a really great communicator of hard things? They're the right things, but they also say them in the right ways. Please, this is up to Ike, and then we'll go Gordon and then Brenna. One more story about my son. Paul. Oh, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> I took him with me to his younger sister's dance recital yes. rehearsal. Yes. And he saw the sister who was um, the second sister, so several years younger than he was, and he went like this to her. Oh. She stomped her foot, <gasps> and she marched up to me. She left the rehearsal and marched up to me oh. and said, Paul's being mean to me. I said, and I, well, she, I couldn't believe it. I said, well, what did he do? He said I was a great big zero. Oh. <laughs> and he was oh, going, no. okay. Right. Yes. Oh. Just, <laughs> despite our best efforts. Yes. Oh, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. That is cute. Um, let's see. Gordon and then Bretta. 
Well, I think the prophet is a good example of doing that because basically the reputation of God's church is in his hands. Whatever he says is going basically to the world. Mm -hmm. And so he has to be really in tune with the spirit. Thank you for that great example. Please, Greta. Well, I was also going to say the prophet, oh, but sure. I think along those lines, I think Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because um, he was very kind. I mean, he was strict, but he wasn't, like, mean about it. He was kind. He was understanding. Yeah. I love that. You think about Christian courage, it has two parts. Christian courage is not only standing up boldly for Christ's doctrine. It's also doing it in a Christ-like way. And sometimes people may have one or not the other. They're, they're so Christ-like they can't bear to teach the doctrine. Or they're so excited about the doctrine they can't stand to be Christ-like. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you for that. Uh, well, friends, uh, I love this quote here by President Fausten. Don't worry, we're coming to your comment, Camilla. Don't worry. I know we've, we've taken a circuitous route back to it. I know you're next. Uh, you know, we need to be fair and compassionate in our dealings with other human beings. The Savior gave us the parable of the unjust servant who owed a large sum of money. His master forgave him the debt, but that same servant went out and had a fellow servant put into prison for a much smaller debt. Their master rebuked him for not showing the same compassion that he had himself received and then sent him to the same fate as his fellow servant. If you will be fair to other people, they will more likely be fair to you. I, I do love that reminder from President Faust from the, the April 2003 conference. Uh, well, Camilla, what was yours? Uh, mine said uh, they should experience the benefits of an impartial dispensation of justice. Mm -hmm. And I love how he's not making them, like, he's not pitying them. Right. He's not saying that they should have any more than any American citizen. Right. But he's also not um, saying that they are less, that they right. um, are lower than the rest of America. Yes. He's saying they should have an impartial dispensation of justice. And I, I love how uh, straightforward and, like, clear it is. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's a wonderful, wonderful insight. Um, we will be fair. And fairness cuts both ways, not just one way. And I, and I love that. It's a wonderful, wonderful insight. Uh, when's a time in your life, as, as we relate this, when's a time in your life where you needed to learn a lesson about fairness? Can you think of one that somebody tried to teach you? Or maybe you just needed to learn it for yourself? JT. So in my family... <laughs> I have six siblings. Okay. And, um, Which number are you? I'm four. The fourth. Okay. Yeah. So I'm the oldest one at home. But like I remember as a young, like when I was a couple years ago, before okay. my older sister moved down, he used to always complain about like, oh, but I did the dishes this morning. She gets to do them tonight. Or like right. just comparing, like <laughs> trying to say that we're being fair. But then <laughs> so like after my sister moved out and I was the oldest, I had to take on all of her responsibilities mm -hmm. and just realizing that it's not really... It doesn't really matter about like what I'm doing as long as we're all working together. Okay. So yeah. I love that. Thank you for that. It reminded me of my kids. <laughs> we made we made we made a rule in our home that uh, contracts need to be signed before trades are uh, are uh, enacted. Uh, because uh, I have uh, you know Mia who'd say, "Now hope, I will give you one doll if you give me one doll, one for one." That's fair. And I'd say, now, wait a minute. Which, which dolls here are you talking about trading? And, you know, Hope was going to receive one that was this big, and Mia was getting something that was like this full-sized, you know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So I love it. But one for one, right? I'll give you one quarter. If you just give me that one green piece of paper that says $50 on it, one for one, right? <laughs> Please. So my grandma, she has this really great quote hung up um, nope. in her on her kitchen cupboards, and it says, um, "Fair isn't everyone getting the same thing. Fair is everyone getting what they need to be successful." Okay. Because, like, um, obviously, like some people need more of something than other people like little babies they don't need a ton of food but 
other people do because okay. they're <laughs> doing a lot more work and um, different things like that. So I, <laughs> I tell Gordon that all the time. I say you don't need as much food as Gordon. You know, you really just don't need those 23 pieces of chocolate. But I, however, am much older and wiser and need those 23 pieces of chocolate. I love that. Yeah, well, as long as like we don't have to have everything exact in the amounts, but as long as everyone is getting what they need to to succeed. Sure. Like maybe someone needs help with this or that, but they don't need something that it's someone else separate. needs. So kind of making sure everyone is in a place where they can progress, mm. but that's obviously not the same right. for everyone. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Is there another hand, I think, somewhere? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Well, that's your... Okay. I just making sure there wasn't a, you know, a hand. We're sensitive to hands. So, you know, friends, I want to think with you for a moment about this idea of uh, fairness. Uh, because certainly, uh, we talk about treating people fairly, um, but does that mean that God has a plan in which this life will be fair? How would, how would you describe that? Because you could look at it in a few ways. Mrs. Anglin, it looked like you, you could speak about that. No, life isn't fair. Everyone has a different situation, and sometimes it's just downright unfair the way people are treated. Right. But we know that ultimately, eternally, mm -hmm. that everything which happens to us, like my dad used to say, is good for us or we deserve it. And, right. and usually it's both. <laughs> right. But we can learn from that. And, you know, when it's in a family and you try to solve the problem, that's always wonderful, but you can't always solve the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, your child might go to school and be beat up or treated really unfairly or right. friends are unkind or whatever. You can't fix that. You can't take control of other people's families and say, you need to be nice. You right. Know? But, and so I think we do have to know that ultimately, eternally, all will be made right. Mm -hmm. So that helps. Oh, I love that. That is a wonderful, wonderful comment. Um, we need to sometimes take off the little vision that we have of everything being in this life and expand and look both backwards into pre-mortality as well as forwards towards eternity to understand that all will be right in the end, if not by the end. So, please, Leah. Um, just really quick, um, I don't think it was completely fair that I had to break my arm, but there was a bigger purpose for my mom to be able to come home, and so I think that, that yeah, that's... Yeah of fairness anyway. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. It's a great example. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we often talk, I think I may have mentioned this before, but it's, it's profoundly affected me. Uh, you know, Elder Christofferson talked about, we, we often will talk about Christ paying the debt that we owe to justice. We talk about that all the time. But he said, we often um, forget that Christ also paid the debt that justice owes to us. That's significant to consider. Uh, that certainly there will be times where this life isn't going to be just. You see all sorts of good people who are quote unquote rewarded um, with terrible things. You you bear your testimony about the truths of the Book of Mormon and you're thrown in jail. Is that fair? <laughs> right? You, you know what I mean? Fair in in the sense that we often think of the word. Um, but certainly Christ understands. You know when when Brenna is trying to be nice and walks down the halls of American Heritage School and smiles at someone and they return the smile with. What are you looking at? What's wrong with you? I mean, whoa, whoa! Hopefully nobody would ever say that, but if they ever do, he's felt that too. And he has paid the debt that justice, in that instance, owes to you. And certainly you will be rewarded um, in the right time and in the right way um, in that situation. You know, I don't know what situations you feel are, are terribly unfair um, in, in your lives. Um, you know, I could think of a number in my own, you know, that it seems like, oh, that, that, boy, that just, that was hard. It was hard, and I didn't feel that I had caused it, but yet it happened. Um, but I want you to know that I definitely have a testimony, um, that I understand that Christ has felt those times where we feel that there is a debt that justice owes to us. And maybe there truly is. Maybe at times we really have been in the right, and people have said we've been in the wrong. Maybe there really have been rumors spread about us that truly are just that, rumors. They're untrue. 
Uh, maybe there have been times um, where we've tried to do the right thing and, and uh, people have taken it the wrong way um, and, and, and gotten us in trouble because of it. Uh, you know, maybe there have been times where we have tried so hard to be good and life doesn't just get better. Um, you know, I was, I, was, I was chatting with the woman once um, who essentially was just saying, you know, I, I just don't know if I can go on. Um, and as I, as I was talking with her, it was interesting because she said, you know, I go to the temple every day. Every day. Every day that it's open, I, I go. Every single day. And I don't miss a day. Um, but, yeah, I don't have this and I don't have that. And these are basic things. I, I, you know, I'm not married and I don't have a job. And my, I have troubles with my children, you know, et cetera. I, I don't get it. Why am I not blessed? Um, and I just had to testify to her, certainly, you are blessed for every good thing you ever do. But that doesn't mean it will be in the way that you think, the way that you want, or in the timing that you expect for every given one of those, of those blessings. Um, I just want to testify that we need to understand that certainly um, blessings come in God's own time and in his own way. And so if right now there's anybody in this room or anybody who's listening who feels... Um, like they've been doing the right things and can't understand why a loving God would not give them what they want because it seems like it's a righteous desire. Um, I want to testify that God doesn't just give good gifts. He really doesn't. Um, he gives the best gifts. And sometimes we are asking for things that are perfectly good. And the answer is no, because he knows that there's something better and ultimately best for us in the future. Um, and that's hard to swallow sometimes when day in and day out we feel like we're doing everything to qualify for a certain blessing that appears very, very righteous to us. When those blessings don't come in our time, we need to understand it doesn't mean that those blessings are wrong or bad, that somehow we're asking for the wrong things. Um, it just might mean that it's not the will of the Lord. And remember, the will of the Lord includes the timing of the Lord. Um, friends, I invite every one of us to think as families and to discuss as families those situations in which we might find ourselves right now that may require us to remember this important truth that Christ paid the price that justice owes to us. And to find solace and comfort and hope in that perfect plan that our Heavenly Father has in a son who would pay not just for the debt that we owe to justice, but also the debt that justice owes to us. That's my invitation. I make it in love, not trying to discount the difficulties that we face that feel so unfair. But I make it in the hope that we will turn to a loving Savior who will then give us the strength not to go around our trials, but to go through them with him leading the way. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Gordon, would you please close our class with a prayer? Thank you so much. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful we could come to Mr. Gentile's class today and Holy Spirit that has been here. Um, please help us to all have a safe drive home and um, please bless Mr. Gentile for the preparation that he has put into this lesson and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your wonderful reasoning and relating today. Look forward to next week with you.